look at all this like i'm fun to have sex with i'm beautiful i'm wonderful i'm smart i'm amazing <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> What's good YouTube, it's your girl Grace Sandra and today I want to talk about how I healed myself from complex PTSD. Let me first say that I am not fully completely healed but I have made major major headway and this is something that a lot of people have asked me about so I wanted to kind of go into the story a little bit. First of all, the difference between PTSD and complex PTSD, they're both anxiety disorder. PTSD is usually triggered by a single event witnessing a single event or being part of a single event like being raped or a earthquake or something like that or watching your house burn down. Complex PTSD is usually brought on by a series of events over time. Complex PTSD is usually worse when you are being harmed or abused by someone who is either supposed to love you as in a domestic violence situation or supposed to care for you or protect you like a caregiver, your parent or your grandmother or your foster parent. Complex PTSD can be brought on in a lot of different ways but it typically gets more severe in those situations. So let me clarify, I'm also not a doctor, counselor, therapist. I've learned a lot over the years studying and trying to get better myself. But what I'm gonna share is my personal journey. I developed complex PTSD really in earnest in early 2017. I was in a domestic violence situation with my ex, now ex-husband, and I do have a series detailing that. I was narcissistically abused in a very severe way and very severely verbally abused, and because someone who was supposed to love me and also he was my caretaker in a way because I was completely and utterly financially dependent on him. One of the ways that complex PTSD can get even more heightened and triggered is if you don't feel like you have any options. At that time I was pregnant and he was my primary financial source of basically not being homeless and my husband and so he fit all of these categories and why I felt completely and totally and utterly helpless. At that time for me complex PTSD looked like fear of almost all situations. I did write this down because I didn't want to forget my particular symptoms. Again, of course, everybody's different. Some symptoms of complex PTSD are avoiding people in certain situations, which is something that I was starting to do, really being afraid of being around people. And for anyone who knows me or who has known me, I'm a huge people person. I've been an extrovert my whole life. I get energy from being around other people. So it was one of the first things that I noticed. I'm really becoming a fearful person. I hadn't yet connected it because I had come complex PTSD from the domestic violence situation I was in for probably two years before I knew that I had complex PTSD. I just noticed things about me were changing. One of the most prominent symptoms that I had was reliving the traumatic events. So because my husband, excuse me, my ex-husband was a very severe verbal abuser, what he did was he used the things, this is part of narcissism too, is using the things that are you are most vulnerable to and things that would hurt you the most and saying those things and saying them in a very violent, toxic way causes more pain. For example, he knew that I was very sensitive about the way I looked, my body and things like that. So when he would say mean things to me about the way I looked and about my body, it impacted me more than him saying, your food tastes shitty. Well, he could have said that not in my well, you know, I'm not the best cook. <laughs> and it wouldn't have bothered me, honestly. I mean, it's not a nice thing to say. But when someone purposefully annihilates you emotionally in ways that they know will harm you, it's very narcissistic and also verbally abusive. So I was constantly replaying those in my head. And I'm going to get to how I got through all of this, but that was a constant. Y'all, I wish I could describe to you how constant it was. The things he said, he said really mean, cutting, very vile, evil things to me. And it would constantly replay in my head. It felt like I had no control which is also another symptom of complex PTSD. I did, in fact, of course, have control. We all have control over what's in our head. But when you don't feel like you do, and you know that it's harming you, it's very, very difficult to escape that cycle. The third one is hyperarousal. It's not about sexual arousal. It's about the arousal of adrenaline and cortisol and all the things that are being kicked up in your body every time there is an abuse situation, or even when you're just reliving the abuse situation. So for me, I felt like my adrenaline was always spiked. My cortisol was always spiked. Part 
of that is in a domestic violence situation or with when you're being narcissistically abused or abused verbally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, in any way by someone who is supposed to care about you, parent, foster parent, adoptive parent, stepdad, whatever. You don't know typically when the next abusive event will happen, so you're always on eggshells. And when you are on eggshells about your life, your personhood, your children, it produces a lot of terror. I'm not talking about being on eggshells that someone might, you know, knock over your cup. I'm talking about someone might knock a pan over your head. It produces a level of terror even when it's not happening because you can't anticipate it. It's called hyper arousal when that's always happening in your body. The next one is you start to believe the world is a scarier place. You know, the world is a scary place. The world is also a very beautiful place. Oftentimes, how we go about our day, day to day, how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about other people is often determined by how we choose to see it. You know, that day, that hour, that minute. For me, I knew I've always known the world is a scary place. I've been an abuse victim for almost all of my childhood. I have a very high A score and I'm typically used to feeling some level of fear about things happening in the world, especially as a woman. You know, I don't really go anywhere by myself without some fear that I could be a victim of a violent crime or rape. And I am also a rape survivor, so I think that adds to it a bit more. So I had my regular schmegular fears is what I was trying to say. But I became someone who became like way more afraid than usual at a level that was alarming to me. The next one is symptoms that come out of nowhere medically, but they are a part of the constant state of hyperarousal. Dizziness, feeling nauseated, feeling shaky, having heart palpitations. Those are all things that I could feel when I was triggered. And I could be triggered by something he posted on Instagram or Twitter. For us, it was Twitter. While he was 200 miles away at work, or it could be him in person verbally viscerating me. Usually it got to the point towards the end of our marriage where where I knew I was being abused and I knew that I had complex PTSD where I started shaking uncontrollably when he would start to be very verbally abusive. I'm gonna go ahead and let those bells ring because they are so damn loud. Okay, there you go. Another one is changes in consciousness. This is not remembering things and having loss of the traumatic things that have happened, just blocking them out of your mind, compartmentalizing. That was happening to me. I was starting to forget things that I knew for sure. I was starting to forget things that I had felt confident about before. I was starting to forget things that even my abuser had done to me because part of narcissistic abuse is emotional manipulation. So when he would come back a love bombing in the next day of the abuse cycle, I could forget about what happened last week, even though would be terribly traumatic. Last week, for example, not last week currently, by the way. The next is Stockholm Syndrome or trauma bonding. Those are a little bit different. Stockholm Syndrome is more of a mental idea and trauma bonding is more you when you become physically peptide addicted to your abuser where they become a literal drug to you. That's what happened to me also. That is a symptom of complex PTSD. Now I'm gonna move on to how I got through that, but I did have every single one of the symptoms on this list when it got to its absolute height. That was pretty much the first eight or nine months of 2019, actually all of 2019 because I started trying to leave in the fall of 2018. And Lee, if you're not familiar with this, some of the ins and out of domestic violence situations, when a woman tries to leave, that's when she's in the most danger. And that's when the abuser really kicks up their abuse. And if you're not able to leave immediately, it can cause a lot of issues. And I was not able to leave immediately. And in fact, we lived together while I was trying to leave for about, I think the first eight or nine months of, of 2019. And it was very traumatic. I was extraordinarily traumatized for all of 2019 because after he left, I went into withdrawal. <laughs> The trauma bonding was so intense that I literally went into physical withdrawal and I thought it was going to kill me. I thought the withdrawal would kill me. I was very intensely trauma bonded. So I would say 2019 is when this hit a fever pitch. Today is June 23rd, I believe, of 2021. <laughs> I know it's 2021, I just don't know if it's June 23rd, but I think it is. I'm about a year and a half out, I would say, from suffering extreme complex PTSD, everything on this list, to now suffering, I would say, two primary symptoms now, but I used to have 15 or 16 symptoms. One of the symptoms I actually forgot on this list that I struggle with the absolute most, my biggest symptom is a huge startle reflex. Let me say really quick about this startle reflex. Because I mentioned I'm a childhood survivor of very extreme abuse, sexual abuse by my father for the first 10 years of my life, and I grew up with a verbally abusive alcoholic brother, alcoholic-like brother. He functioned like an alcoholic, but I'm not sure that he was an alcoholic. I'm not sure what is wrong with him, honestly, because he's still the same way. But I believe that I've always had some form of complex PTSD. I also grew up with a mother who was mentally ill my whole life. She's a paranoid schizophrenic, now has dementia. But anyway. 
So I believe I've always had some form of complex PTSD until I moved out of my childhood home and all of the trauma when, when I went to college and then when I got married. However, I have always had a horrible, horrible startle reflex. It's like the one thing in my life that has followed me everywhere I went. Like I get scared so very easily. But when the complex PTSD picked up in the domestic violence situation in my second marriage, FYI, was not abused in my first marriage, but in my second marriage when that picked up, my startle reflex became out of control. Y'all I'm talking about, if I were sitting at my desk and I saw a mask fly by in the corner of my eye, I would be like, ah! that's, that's how out of control. And I'm not exaggerating. You can ask my partner, ask anybody who knows me, how out of control my startle reflex has become since I was in a domestic violence situation. It's it's insane. Before, whereas I could have a, like a really strong response, once I was in the domestic violence situation, it did all sorts of things in my body, all manner of things in my body where it would just start freaking out and it could be literally the mess. Nothing real. My body was telling me, there is a bear that's about to kill you. You have to freak out because there's a bear. Meanwhile, it would be something out of the corner of my eye. That's one symptom that has not left me because I think it's because it's always been since childhood but it just got so much worse and now it's more manageable it's like embarrassing to be this scared but I don't watch anything scary I don't ever watch horror movies crime movies crime tv read books that have anything sad or whatever I have to like stay in a positive everything just to control this startle reflex lord let me move on to how I feel what I did to heal myself once I realized I had complex PTSD. I wanna share really quickly how I knew I had it. When I was going through what I was going through, I was posting a lot of stuff on Facebook about how sad I was and how my husband was in the process of devaluing me. I didn't know what narcissistic abuse was, but he was in the devaluing phase where he was starting to let me know that I wasn't shit to him, essentially and I was pregnant with his child. Very emotional when you're pregnant. Being devalued, he had other women on the side that I didn't know about at the time, but I felt it. You know how you, you know how women are. We know when our husbands have something else going on, but I couldn't prove it. I was just writing a lot of sad shit, honestly, on Facebook. And one of my friend's friends reached out to me and said, I would like to talk to you if you don't mind, because I feel like we're going through some similar things. And I said, oh, what the hell? And she told me what was going on in her marriage, which was falling apart. She was being very severely abused in many ways that were much worse than what I was going through, actually. She said, sister, I'll never forget this because we're best friends now, like completely and utterly best friends. She's one of the great loves of my life. We're not gay, but we are best friends. <laughs> anyway, she said to me, I really think that you are being narcissistically abused. Are you aware of what that is? And I said, I'm not. She was like, I really think that you have complex PTSD. Do you know what that is? And I said, I don't. And then she said, I very much think you are trauma bonded to him. Do you know what that is? And I said, I don't. And she said, I think you need to start doing some research because this is not gonna get any better. I'm so thankful, but anyway, I started looking into it. Probably took me three weeks of non-stop Google search, reading everything I could get my hands on, and then I realized I have very deep complex PTSD. I am very deeply trauma bonded to him, and he is narcissistically abusing the fuck out of me. Once I realized, that was just the first important step. You know, it's kind of like the alcoholic. Once you realize you're an alcoholic, that's your first step, that's the first major hurdle, is just admitting you have a problem. So for me, just it admitting I had a problem, I needed to deal with both myself and him. After that, I started consuming information at a fever pitch because I felt like I have to understand this. I have to understand what's happening to me. I need to understand what narcissists are and what they do and how they manipulate. And I need to get a cursory education on how I need to handle this and how I should be. And I realized all the things I was doing was hurting me more. I realized I was giving him supply. I was giving him the bullets and the gun that he was using to shoot me. I realized through so much information gathering that there was something happening to me that was so much bigger than even what I thought. And the complex PTSD aspect, it became very obvious to me that I was not in control of my body. When he started very extreme verbal viscerations 
I don't even think that's a word, but anyway. Cause this was early 2017, I think when we had this call, me and my girl. So when I realized that I had in fact complex PTSD, after I'd done all the research and I realized I was not in control of my body, that when he would verbally attack me and verbally annihilate me or yell at me or use physical intimidation, my body would start responding with the heart palpitations. And when my body started responding that way, I would clutch my heart and sometimes be like, please stop, please stop. And a few times I went to the ER and, and they were saying, you know, you're having a very severe anxiety attack. Is there anything leading to your anxiety? And at that time I felt like I couldn't tell them. So I just said, I'm under a lot of stress. And they were like, well, you need to de-stress. I did a few key things. I learned how to calm my body down through diaphragmatic breathing. I made myself, forced myself every day to learn how to take very deep breaths and do it over and over and over again until my body completely calmed down. It was the only thing, honestly, the only thing that helped. There were other things that helped temporarily to calm me down. I could phone a friend. Yes, I could call somebody. I could reach out to somebody. Sometimes if I just went outside for a walk or something like that, that could help. But it was so temporary. Sometimes if I watched even a YouTube video of somebody who understood or who was going through what I was going through, that would help, but it was so temporary. But diaphragmatic breathing was the only thing that really told my whole body, a bear is not here to kill you. Yes, you might be afraid that your ex-husband, that husband at the time is gonna kill you, but it's not a bear. And the chances are very low that he will actually kill you, even though there were times I was actually very afraid of that. I committed to basically creating a ritual out of that. At that point, I had already been a prayer. I've always, for, you know, most of my life, I've considered myself to be a Jesus following Christian although I am not an evangelical anymore but I do consider myself to be a Jesus follower but in any case I've always believed in the power of prayer but I did not ever connect prayer and slowing down and meditation and getting my body to a certain place for me prayer was about asking God for shit like God can you help me which I was doing but I was not saying God can you help me calm my body I was not doing anything before that before I realized I had complex PTSD to actually address what was happening in my body you might be wondering did you go to therapy no I did not go to therapy at that time because I did not have have a job and I did not have insurance and I was not on any insurance and so I we could not afford therapy I did go to one session that was like hundred and eighty dollars and then I couldn't go back because I couldn't even pay that bill so I did not go to therapy due to financial reasons not any other reason I was not aware of better help and things like that at that time also when you're in an abuse situation you have complex PTSD solving problems is not always your biggest strong suit <laughs> I was not able to think what is how do I solve this problem right now of this therapy problem i probably could have dug a little deeper but it was just not on the forefront of my mind everybody kept bringing it up and i just kept saying i don't have options i don't have options i don't have options i don't have enough money i'm not making enough money i don't make any money in lieu of therapy i did talk to my girlfriends quite a bit so number one is the diaphragmatic breathing number two is i sought support through my girlfriends i sought support through anyone who i could tell was understanding of narcissistic abuse understanding of complex ptsd and understanding what the hell was happening to my body and if someone showed even a slight sign that they did not understand complex ptsd or have empathy for it I would not talk to them about it anymore I basically placed myself in a very small bubble of people who understood my life and that really alienated quite a lot of people but frankly my dear I don't give a damn if you're going through something so severe that only people who've been through it truly understand or can empathize with you do not seek support from people who don't get it or might belittle your experience or belittle what you've experienced because what I found is that only people who have directly experienced very severe narcissism abuse understand it only people who've experienced the full ramifications of complex PTSD really have empathy for what you're living through and the kind of trauma that it creates in both your mind and your body I created support in a very safe very small bubble number three I sought support amongst groups I joined probably three or four or five both narcissistic support groups and complex PTSD recovery groups with people again who understood and have empathy for the very specific things that I was going through at the time I was vulnerable so I didn't just go to those groups and watch I went to those groups and shared I didn't just go to my friends and just sit on the phone and cry I shared with them what was going on I shared with people who wanted to listen I probably embarrassed myself sharing too much I probably shared shared way too much on Instagram, way too much on Facebook. I just had a good proper cry and I think it may have helped. But pray for me today y'all because I'm just, I've slumped. 
slump, slump, slump. But I also felt like I need help and I don't give a fuck. What y'all think? Okay, I'm just keeping it real right now. I did not want to risk going through something horrible like losing my house, losing my kids, losing my life because I didn't want to share. You know what I'm saying? I'm not stubborn like men are sometimes. <laughs> I'm not an anti-man, but sometimes men are stubborn to their own detriment and I'm just the exact opposite. I will literally embarrass myself seeking support. I also was so honest that a few people were reaching out to me. How can I help you? What can I do? And I did end up, someone else ended up hosting a fundraiser for me to get financial support so that I could begin to address what was happening to me, both the narcissistic abuse and the complex PTSD. And then I was able to start there with someone who I felt like I could afford either 40 or $60 an hour, I can't remember, but I was able to at that point afford seeing her once a week for a while and then I did slow down. Another thing I did was I created another ritual of taking the things that my ex-husband, my husband at the time, that he was saying to me, I began reversing what he was saying, putting it in a positive way. For example, sex thing was a big, big, big issue, a big point of tension, a big point of sadness for me because he didn't want to do it with, didn't seem to find me attractive or want to have any interest in complimenting me and touching me sexually or non-sexually, hugging me, rubbing my back, nothing. I had to beg for every single touch I got. And one of the things he said to me in one of his mean rants was like, It's a chore to have sex with you. It's such a chore. And man, that hurt me. Like, y'all, oh my God, that hurt me so much. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it made me so miserable. Lord have mercy. But anyway, one of the things that I did was I started versing it. For example, when he said that, you know, I would write down the truth. My truth for today is it's fun to have sex with me. <laughs> That sounds so crazy, but it really did help. So I wrote down the opposite of what he said. You know, he never actually straight up said you're ugly. He just treated me like I was ugly. Like I was just so unattractive and like, how could he ever want to touch me? How could he ever want to have sex? And I had been before that, I had actually been a pretty confident woman. I felt pretty confident in my looks and my body most of my life, but after being with him, he just totally completely decimated my self-esteem. And I really felt like no man will ever want to have sex with me ever again. I'm telling y'all, I literally believe that. That's another complex PTSD symptom is that it changes your consciousness about yourself. It changes your view of the world. And my view of the world changed so much that I thought no other man would ever want to have sex with me after him ever again. And let me tell y'all, that's the furthest thing from the truth. <laughs> anyway, so he never directly said you're ugly, but let's say if he had, just for example, I would say, Grace, you are, I would write down, Grace, you are not ugly, you are beautiful. And I reversed the negative things that he was saying about me. But not only that, y'all, I also reversed the negative things that I had been saying to myself about myself. So I had been saying, you're a failure, you're a loser, you're so terrible and vile, you can't even get your husband to have sex with you. Like, what kind of woman can't even get her husband to fuck her? All these mean thoughts in my head, I actually wrote them down in an opposite form. Just like the breathing, just like the meditation, I made it a ritual. And it, you know, honestly, I think if you were to ask me, why did you keep coming back to that? I realized I felt so good about it. Like, I would actually look forward to it. Like, oh, I can't wait till the time of the day because, you know, at this point I had a newborn and two other kids. So time was not of the essence. I was full time raising my new newborn. And my husband at that time was living two hours away in a different state and a different time zone for work. I was not around him. I was taking care of the baby full time. I didn't have a lot of time, but I found myself looking forward to when she would go down for her nap, when she had four naps, three naps, two naps, like the whole time that I was raising her from her newborn stage. I could not wait till her first nap of the day so that I could sit down with my journal and write down my positive affirmation statements because I would feel so good afterwards like, Look at all this, like I'm fun to have sex with, I'm beautiful, I'm wonderful, I'm smart, I'm amazing, <laughs> you know? I really started to look forward to that time. Then I started writing more I am statements, I started writing dreams for myself, I started dreaming bigger, and those all became this really, really, really involved daily practice of journaling. I am statements, I'm committed to becoming, I'm grateful for statements, the reverse statements, what I wanna do with my life, what I wanted to happen for sure. Like one thing I've written for all this time is I want to become a New York Times bestselling author, which is like a lifelong dream of mine. I've been writing it every day. So I'm just expecting at some point that's going to happen. That was a big part of my healing process, y'all. What some people might now say is scripting. What some people might now say is manifesting. I didn't know what the hell that shit was. I didn't know what manifesting was. I didn't know what scripting was. <laughs> 
I was just trying to make myself feel better, y'all. You know, sometimes I'm like, it don't matter what you call it. If you are determined to get better, you will get better. And I can honestly say that journaling ritual practice of both the breathing and the writing out of all of those things and forcing myself, forcing myself to write down 10 things that I was grateful for every day, even if the day was a shit sandwich and I was suicidal. During this time, I wanna remind y'all, not only were my complex PTSD symptoms raging out of control, I was suicidal probably once a month. Very, very seriously suicidal. The abuse was so bad. My body was so out of control. I was not sleeping. I was taking care of an infant. I was in a bad way, y'all. <laughs> yeah. My husband wouldn't touch me. The type of abandonment that I was experiencing took me back to the inner child in me, the three-year-old in me that was terrified. My husband knew how to take me back to that little inner child so quickly to a place of trauma and fear that I would have done anything he asked me to just to make it stop. Anything. If he said, get on your knees and bark like a dog for two hours, I would have done it, done anything to make him stop. He, it was relentless and awful. I really cannot underscore how emotional torturous it is to have your body feel out of control like complex PTSD makes you feel while you're being narcissistically abused. So that practice, I totally completely believe saved my life. And then the last thing I did, I mean, of course I did so many more things, but I'm going to kind of hit on the majors because the majors led to more things. You know, the meditation practice, the diaphragmatic breathing led to healthy body things. The journaling practice, the reverse affirmations led to the gratitude which led to the I am statements, which led to the I am becoming statements, which led to the scripting or whatever, you know. And the other major piece was reading. I started reading stories and books from other survivors and other people who lived through complex PTSD or who had a very bad case of it like I did, people who survived narcissistic abuse and people who've been through grief. A book that I love by a more maybe well-known author that you guys might know is Sheryl Sandberg, who was the CEO of Facebook, whose husband died suddenly and then she wrote a book about grief and unexpected loss and that introduced me to the the name of the book is called option b which introduced me to her facebook group full of other grief survivors people who've lost their child unexpectedly and things like that and so it just kind of led to more books it led to more opportunities more friends who understood things and then as i got better i started to see opportunities for me to reach out to other people so the big things led to more and more things at some point when i started scripting and started i'm not even going to call it scripting i'm just going to say journaling when i started started journaling at one point but I feel like there was probably a day where I just said I'm committed to this I want better I just want better for my life I deserve better I don't want this life and I don't want my kids to see my life go in this direction where I'm probably gonna end up killing myself or being murdered that is as important as anything I've said is the commitment to free myself from complex PTSD to heal my body to heal my mind to leave the domestic violence situation that is as important but I honestly didn't get to that sense until I was writing it out every day and realizing I want so much fucking more for my life than this shit show you know so now you know my life isn't perfect by any stretch at all not at all but I have two complex PTSD symptoms I do feel like I have healed myself in a great many ways I also have a ton of support that I have sought out I cannot go without saying this I did 16 very intense EMDR sessions with a licensed medical professional for an intense three months. I do have a series on my EMDR experience. Without the EMDR, I probably would not have made it. The EMDR came when I was at the most suicidal and when I was at the end of my mother love and rope. It dramatically changed my life. I mean, I went from, I want to die, I will die, I'm going to jump into a lake, I'm going to murder myself, to in about three months time feeling like I can live, I have hope, I'm okay, I'm gonna be okay. It was wild how amazing that experience was but the reason why I told you that last is because if I hadn't done that other stuff I would not have been ready for EMDR. EMDR I do think you have to be ready for the intensity of that experience the kind of trauma that it will bring up in you from your childhood from everything from what the trauma is that gave you CPTSD in the first place you have to be ready for that shit you can't just jump in like if I had tried to jump into EMDR in 2016 or 2017 I would not have received it well 
know, everything I did between December 2016 through January 2020, or even maybe December 2019, is what I needed to do to be ready for EMDR to change my whole fucking life. I kind of wanted to say it last because I think there's other things that need to be addressed first. There's some emotional maturity for me. I shouldn't speak for other people. I don't know. I don't know. Because if you have complex PTSD, go get you some EMDR. You know, at least give it a shot. For me, I was finally ready for it. And also, at that time, my narcissistically abusive ex-husband had discarded me so thoroughly, so cruelly, so meanly, and so violently so emotionally violently he was killing me from the inside out i was like dragging on the floor ready to die i was so ready to heal so that his actions could not affect me like that anymore Whew, it's, so, it's been so intense <laughs> and i have committed to doing all of the things i do all of the maintenance now as well so the reason why complex ptsd is managed now i no longer struggle with very severe emotional regulation now i can emotionally regulate very quickly and easily now when I practice diaphragmatic breathing, before it would take me half an hour, 45 minutes, two hours sometimes of having to do that to calm my body down so my body knew that I was not in the presence of a black bear who was about to maul me to death. Now it takes two minutes, two minutes, maybe even three breaths for my body to know like, hey, you're okay. It's really okay. Yes, you've been triggered. You are okay. And then I can emotionally regulate. Now, if I start to have looping thoughts, I can say to myself, you don't have to do that. You don't have to loop that. It's not necessary. You can think about something else. And then I do. And now if I find myself saying something mean to myself, I can say pretty quickly and really easy, like, we're not gonna do that. You're not gonna be mean to yourself. It's off limits. So find something nice to say or don't say anything at all. <laughs> Seriously, like I can just be like you, you're kind, you're amazing, you're insightful, you're wise, you're smart, you're loved, you're beautiful inside and out and we're not listening to any negative comments. So all that comes very easy to me. You have no idea the battle it has taken to keep you. So anyway, <laughs> that is how I healed my complex PTSD. I would be very interested to hear if you have been a complex PTSD survivor, if you're in it now, what your struggles are. Feel free, you can email me at any time at grace at outheretryingtosurvive.com. I also have a support group for women who are complex PTSD survivors or who are domestic violence survivors dealing with trauma bonding. Any sort of abuse, financial, physical, anything like that is called Black Women Breaking Free. We meet via Facebook. It is a private aid subscription group. It's only $10 a month because I want it to be affordable for all survivors and all Black women who are hurting and going through this kind of thing. I also am coming forward very soon with a course on how I vulnerability, resilience, and bravery and empathy to heal and get through and get out of the domestic violence situation I was in. So if you're interested in that course, it's also gonna be very affordable. Please sign up for my newsletter, which is below so that you can be updated about it. And also I'm so excited about this. Like <laughs> I have some merch coming soon and that is gonna be available on my site, www.outheretryingtosurvive.com. Um, finally pick up my book grace actually stories of love loss faith and black womanhood that is available on amazon right now i love you guys so much and i'm so grateful to share this journey and thank you so much for watching for riding with me if you haven't yet please subscribe please give me a like please help me get in good with these youtube algorithms because they don't like me it feels like anyway love y'all and talk to you later bye